Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lipid-Based Formulations from Early Development to Clin Commercial Manufacturing, presented by Capsigel. I'm Eric Saganowski, Associate Editor with Fierce Markets Life Sciences, and I'll be moderating this webinar. Our speakers today are Jan Vertemann, Senior Director of Product De Development and Manufacturing at Capsigel, Jane Frazier, Director, Research and Development at Capsigel, Mark Antoine Pearson Faber, Senior Technical Manager at, with Mylan. You can read their full bios on the left side of your window. Just a few technical notes before we begin. If you'd like to download this slide deck, please click the Files button at the lower left corner of your screen. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand within 24 hours after the event. We will follow the presentations with a Q&A session. Please submit your questions during or after the presentations by clicking on the Q&A button on the lower left corner of your screen. Okay, now let's begin. Jan, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening. So let's move to uh, slide two uh, with the uh, agenda. So we will sh uh, shortly start with an, uh, an introduction on lipid-based uh, formulations, followed by a section in which we will discuss in more detail bioavailability enhancement using lipid-based formulations, discuss in a third section lipid-based capsule products by encapsulating the lipid-based formulations. Uh, Jane will then uh, follow up with process development and scale-up of liquid fill heart capsules. And our guest speaker from Mylon, Marc-Antoine, will then present a case study of a soft gelatin capsule, fast track technology transfer and will uh, highlight the success factors for this successful uh, transfer. And of course, at the end, we will allow some time for some uh, Q&A uh, session. Let's move um, into the webinar, starting with the introduction, and move swiftly to slide four. In slide four, you can see the classification system for lipid-based formulations as proposed by Professor Poulton from the Monash University in, uh, in Australia, following many years of uh, collaboration with Capsugel. And you can uh, notice in the table that there are four main type of formulations, and type one uh, composed of oils, and type four at the other end of the spectrum comprised of water-soluble surfactants and co-solvents. This classification is uh, widely accepted and also widely used within the scientific community and provided much needed clarity in classifying the different types of lipid-based formulations on composition, but mainly focusing on performance criteria, dispersion and digestion being the main criteria. And as you can see, the type one are typically oily formulations that have limited or no dispersion, but will require a digestion. While at the other end of the spectrum, you have the type four lipid-based formulations. Upon dispersion, will provide micellar solutions and have typically limited digestion. And in between the type two and type three, the SETS and SMETS formulas, and we will discuss the development of these formulas in some detail in the uh, following slides. As you can see in slide five, there are quite uh, a wide range of applications for the lipid-based formulations, uh, ranging from uh, an exon dosage form for low-dose high-potency compounds, especially uh, certainly with the dose accuracy, homogeneity that is assured with lipid-based formulations. They can provide improve, improved stability. Uh, an example is, uh, for instance, vancomycin. Can be used to create abuse deterrence formulas, allow you to go quickly into clinical development, allow also to make 505B2 applications, and uh, can assure that certain uh, patents get a live extension for of patent uh, compounds. 
We will focus now on one main topic, which is bioavailability enhancement, which is, I would say, a key element that uh, lipid-based formulations can uh, bring to the table. Moving to slide six for the discussion on the bioavailability enhancement using these lipid-based formulations, we will see in slide seven that a typically a lipid-based compound is selected based on some of the criteria that are listed in the slide. First of all, some physical chemical characteristics like the dose, depending whether we want to solubilize the compound in a lipid-based formulation or suspend. We may reach doses up to 200 for milligrams for a solubilized system, up to 400, 500 milligram for a suspended uh, compound in a lipid-based formulation. We will see later in the presentation we are talking typically about poorly water-soluble compounds, typically with a log P above 3. Structural uh, information can help in selection of the excipients, as well as certain information on, for instance, polar surface area to uh, assess whether it's a good candidate or help in selection of excipients. Besides these uh, physical chemical properties, we typically will also take a look at some biological factors as lipid-based formulations have the potential to influence some of the biological elements related to the compound. And typically we will take a look to, at compounds that typically have a good uh, permeability, relatively low bioavailability, and some of the compounds may be uh, subject to PGP efflux or pre-systemic metabolism where we will uh, bring in certain excipients as we can see on the next slide, on slide 8, presenting some work that Capsugel did in collaboration with Professor Sugiyama in Japan showing that uh, some of these excipients can have an effect on efflux transports, some on PGP, some on BCRP, or even on both of these uh, efflux transporters in case of, for instance, some of the tweens or the spans or the gramophores. So selecting the excipients based on physical, chemical, and biological factors will allow to start the formulation development which will typically, and that can be seen on slide nine, will start with a solubility screening if you want to develop a solubilized lipid-based formulation in which the compound will be fully uh, solubilized. So typically, excipients are selected, solubility is assessed, and then the challenge is to come up with the right combination of excipients, and typically uh, binary or ternary phase diagrams are being constructed or are being retrieved from a database as CAPGL has such databases available, allowing to select, I would say, the combination or the right combinations of excipients that can solubilize the compound, but can also give a proper um, behavior upon dispersion and digestion. So we will select the right excipient combinations and solubilize the compounds and submit them typically to dispersion and digestion as proposed by Colin uh, Powton at the Monash University. So talking about the dispersion, we can take a look on slide uh, 10. On the left-hand side in the picture, we have two formulas in which the compound is solubilized. And upon dispersion, typically with an aqueous environment, about 250 milliliters, you can see on the right-hand side that you may have a different behavior. We will certainly look to avoid any phase separation during the dilution, but especially check for any compound precipitation. We start from a solubilized system, and to increase in a maximum way this, the bioavailability, we want to make sure that the compound remains in solution upon dispersion, which will typically happen in the stomach. So we can then indeed go a little bit in more detail and assess the particle size 
of the, uh, the discussions that are formed and indeed uh, go in further details. But the main criteria will be formulas that upon dispersion do not cause crash out of the compound, which would potentially not be available for absorption anymore. Moving from slide 10 into slide 11, showing the second uh, performance criteria, which is the uh, digestion testing. And we can assume upon dispersion that the formula will move towards the small intestine, where typically uh, lipids are digested, or depending on the composition, may not be digested in case of selection of excipients like, for instance, a cremophore or other lipid-based excipients that are not really prone to digestion testing, such as, for instance, also vitamin E, TPGS. In case of a suspension formula, and typically during digestion, a part of the suspended compound will go in solution and will become available for absorption. Typically, in that digestion test, again, we will assess whether the formula is digested, yes or no. This will typically mainly depend on the excipient composition. But we will also check by taking samples at regular intervals that, indeed, again, there is no or very limited compound precipitation out of a solubilized system, or in case of a dispersion, is the other way around, that the maximum of amount of dispersed drug goes into solution upon digestion. So taking dispersion and digestion are the two criteria. Ideally, no precipitation during dispersion and none or very limited a precipitation upon digestion will give the right formulas. As you can see on slide 12, which is a poster presentation that was made a couple of years ago at the AAPS, showing a series of compounds that have been formulated using lipid-based formulations. Again, you see typically compounds that are suitable with a molecular weight around 500 up to 750 but typically less than 1,000, with typically a log P between 3 and 5, or above 5, but certainly above 3. Typically poor dissoluble, but quite well permeable, unless it's linked to a PGP, efflux, or some challenges with intestinal, um, I would say, metabolism that can be overcome using lipid-based formulations. And we see in the table, um, in the column showing the dispersion testing, that for all these formulas, you had um, no precipitation before the three hours time point. So within three hours after executing the dispersion test, there was no precipitation of the compound. And during digestion, there was none or very limited um, precipitation, at least 70 to 80 percent of the compound remained in solution. And if these two criteria are met for compounds having the right characteristics, with a good lipid based formulation, you will see in the last column, in every case, you will increase bioavailability considerably compared to a reference powder formula or the neat compound as such. I've included uh, one uh, example in a little bit more detail in slide 13, where you can see a case study of such a compound with a uh, log P of 4, molecular weight around 500, poorly water soluble, but highly permeable, so a real BCS class 2 compound, where you can see that the work that was presented at a conference in Verona by Professor Freilink, that you can see that a lipid-based semi-solid formulation can outperform for the right compound with the right formula other bioavailability enhancing technologies such as a spray-dry dispersion, in this case the amorphous formula, or other approaches like Professor Freilink is a specialist in inulin formulations which he had also prepared, all improved by availability with the right compound at the right occasion 
the lipid-based formulation may outperform other approaches for the right compound. So moving to the next slide, uh, towards an, uh, an example of a suspension-type lipid-based formulation. In this particular case, it was a compound, again, with a molecular weight around 500, with a low aqueous solubility, high apparent permeability, and being a substrate for CYP3A4 and PGP. But unfortunately for this particular compound, the solubility in lipid-based excipients was extremely low. And in this particular case, we selected to prepare a suspension type formula, especially to interact with the biological factors. And the formula, therefore, contained a tocopherol uh, derivative, vitamin E TPGS, known to have uh, an effect the PGP efflux, and some other lipidic surfactants, such as certain chromophores, knowing to have, uh, again, an effect on PGP and CYP3 4 metabolism. And this formula was then uh, tested in a clinical study, showing that indeed, thanks to uh, the solubility enhancement and the effect on the biological factors, the uh, AUC could be increased sixfold uh, compared, sorry, twofold increase in AUC and a sixfold increase in CMAX for the lipid based formula compared to a reference dry powder formula which was a so-called uh, optimized uh, formula. So both a solution type as a suspension type lipid-based formulation can successfully enhance uh, bioavailability. And once we have developed these formulas, in the next step, these formulas are, are to be encapsulated. And as we can see on slide 16, Typically, two dosage forms are very well suited for encapsulation of these lipid-based formulas. Typically, it is the soft or the hard capsule dosage form that will provide the final dosage form for these lipid-based formulas. The choice between soft and hard can be made as a function of uh, the formulation characteristics. A semi-solid formula having a melting point above 35, 37, uh, typically uh, will uh, tend towards a hard capsule format, as we can fill at higher temperatures. Hydrophilic formulas, such as a PG400 formula, will rather tend to a soft capsule, as there we can tailor make the shell composition to avoid any uh, brittleness of the capsule once the capsule has been, uh, has been made. There may be a preference for a certain polymer. Hard capsules are available in gelatin, like in soft, but they're also available in uh, cellulose derivatives, HPMC or pululam. The starch is another material that can be used and has been applied, for instance, to the soft gel uh, dosage form. So depending on a certain polymer selection, one or the other, maybe pr the preferred dosage form for your final product. And of course, uh, something we should not forget, marketing preference can play an important role, whether a soft gel or a hard capsule format would be uh, developed upfront or later on, depending, is there a choice between the two dosage forms. One element to be uh, stressed before I hand over to Jane is that typically hard capsules are uh, filled, but to make sure that there is no leakage, they will be banded with a gelatin band or sealed using uh, technologies such as the LEMS technology that you can see on the right-hand side of the uh, slide in the uh, picture on the right-hand side where you can see such a LEMS piece of equipment combined with a cooling conveyor for a semi-solid lipid-based formula that is being produced at capsule gel. On the left-hand side of the picture, uh, you see, or the slide, sorry, you see ty a typical soft gel line that is also available at uh, capsule gel. So this is a short introduction on uh, the lipid-based formulations, how they can be developed, 
how they can be encapsulated. And I will hand over now to my colleague uh, Jane, who will be uh, presenting a particular case study on a heart filling approach for such a lipid based formulation. Jane, I will hand over to you. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Jane Fraser, and I'm going to discuss process development and scale up of liquid filled hard capsules. We can move on to slide 19. Liquid filling of cardio capsules is an extremely simple process comprising of three main steps mixing, where the drug um, compound is, is compounded, filling, where the product is encapsulated, and banding, where the product is either sealed um, or banded using a gelatin band. This is particularly evident um, when compared to a modified release tableting process, where several additional steps, which add additional complexity, are required. Liquid filling into hard shell capsules is a simple manufacturing process which offers a versatile solution to the challenges which can be encountered in drug development and ultimately um, allows for products to reach the marketplace faster. Moving on to slide 20. Um, it is important when considering any manufacturing process um, to utilize the principles of quality by design. Um, we must design the product requirements based on the target product profile using the key steps of process design to ensure a robust and reproducible and ultimately in control process. The development process needs to understand the relationship between the quality attributes of a product um, and the material attribute and process parameters. This allows an overall control strategy um, to be designed for that product. If we look at some case studies um, where a liquid filled hard capsule process was scaled up, product A was um, a biological compound which required gastric protection. It was a suspension formulation, and this was filled at ambient conditions. And if you look at product B, this was a solution formulation of a highly potent compound, which was compounded and filled at elevated temperatures. The main focus here will be to look at the process development surrounding the filling and banding. If we move on to slide 22, um, when we look at the filling of capsules, we need to investigate the process parameters which can influence their uh, product attributes. There are a range of process parameters to be considered, nozzle sizes, filling speed, pump drawback, pump temperature, the hopper stirrer speed and temperature all play a part in the, the final um, process and product attributes. Dripping, splashing, and tailing will be pretty apparent um, during um, the filling process. Um, these will typically interrupt the filling process. You will be able to visually see if, if you have this, this problem during your process. You can see it in the picture in the, the bottom of the slide. Another key aspect which needs to be considered during filling is filling weight control and content uniformity. If we look at the data on slide 23, which was generated during the filling of the suspension product, compound A, under optimized filling conditions, um, this demonstrated that we have excellent data for both um, CPK and PPK indicating that we have a very robust process. The data is consistently close 
she's a target for both assay and weight control. And the graph shows um, a very narrow profile. The process here is in control. This particular compound was successfully um, transferred and completed its process validation. If we now turn our attention to compound B, compound B is a solution at high temperature. This compound was transferred to us at a late stage. Um, we already had a, an established formulation and process for this compound. And on the face of it, it seemed like a very straightforward um, process. And there was no alarm bells and, and nothing would have led us to believe it wasn't a straightforward process. However, during scale-up, some issues were identified. A significant effect was observed between the filling speed and the performance of the process. At both 50,000 capsules per hour and 30,000 capsules per hour, um, capsules were observed to be opening on the bander. Regular sticking of the capsules was, was also seen in the rectification rollers. And in both cases, um, the trial had to be stopped. A further trial was then performed at 20,000 capsules per hour. And this one proceeded without interruption. Um, all the other criteria required by um, the, the capsules were, were met during this process. There was no, um, no other issues. The, the main issue was with the, the processing. If we look at slide 25, we performed an investigation to look at the causes behind this issue. And really, the, the problem was if the encapsulation machine was run at speed, the process had to be stopped. We were really experiencing a high-speed car crash. At high speed, elongated capsules were observed, and this indicated an overpressurization within the capsules. Capsules at high speed were seen to jam inside the rectification rollers, and this is primarily because of the elongated capsules. So we went to look at this problem further um, on slide 26. The hypothesis that had been um, provided was overpressurization. So to um, prove this, we conducted an experiment to heat the capsules to 63 degrees to ensure that all the capsule contents had become fully molten. Upon piercing, a liquid was expelled from the capsule. And the graph indicates um, a percentage weight loss from the capsules following piercing. This demonstrated a difference in the internal pressure between the capsules filled at 30,000 and 50,000 capsules per hour, and those filled at 20,000 capsules per hour. This demonstrates that during the filling process at higher speeds, capsules will leak and pop open during the banding, um, leading to constant process interruptions. So what causes this pressurization if you look at slide 27? Capsules closed at high speed um, will allow less time for any air entrapped um, to be released. The air cannot escape from the capsule. Typically, um, at a volume of a capsule um, for filling would be around 80%. In the, the case of the product that was transferred, um, the fill volume was around 90%, which contributes to this overpressurization. And this, together with the elevated filling temperature, increases that pressure further. This resulted in a restriction um, to the filling speed. So the filling speed that could be attained was 20,000 capsules per hour. Unfortunately, at this late stage of the program, it was not possible to make any adjustments to the capsule size or to the formulation that would have allowed um, a higher speed to be attained. However, it should be noted that the process validation was successful, and over 20 um, batches have been manufactured. Whilst with regards to the filling speed, it's not an ideal filling speed, but we do know that this works successfully.
So in conclusion, this typical process control strategy for a liquid filled hard capsule is simple um, and effective. For mixing, um, we consider appearance or possibly in process assay. For filling, we look at weight control and closed join length. With banding or sealing, we consider um, appearance checks and outline checks. This is a versatile process which will meet many um, compound challenges. In comparison to many other pharmaceutical um, processes, this is extremely simple and straightforward. And Capsa Gel has the ability and capability to um, develop formulations from development right through to commercial with a range of equipment at multiple scales. This allows the development of a simple manufacturing process which is scalable, robust, and well controlled. Thank you very much. I'll hand over to our other speaker. Thank you, Jane. So, uh, welcome everyone. So, my name is uh, Marc Antoine Pierre Saint Faber. Uh, I'm located uh, in, in France, and I would like to talk to you about success factor in tech transfer. Uh, and we, we got this uh, experience through a, a, success, uh, a successful transfer from uh, a donor site to the, the Capsugel plant Plormel. So, that's why I was asked uh, speaking today to this presentation. So, uh, indeed, um, the lessons learned we had during this, uh, this experience we had with, between Mylan and Capsugel is that we interacted eff efficiently to drive the tech transfer from, from a, a well-known soft-shell capsule on the, on the French market for a well-established brand, and we moved uh, to the Plormel site, and we, we, we moved quite quickly, and we have realized a fast track and, and indeed, uh, the goal was to enable product supply to the French market. During this presentation today, I will specific, specifically highlight three different bullet points. First, indeed, why, why this fast track? How and what was the output and what was the project design? Second bullet point is we experienced uh, something which is not quite usual in that kind of project is Capsugel as project lead in the, in the tech transfer project. And indeed, uh, Mylan and, and our partner, we were more acting as project facilitator. So when, when is the need to for a fast track tech transfer? Indeed, uh, our situation was that our uh, encapsulation site uh, so, uh, was uh, removed its manufacturing license by the French administration, so we could not really, we, no, no, we had no active encapsulation site. So the product supply to the market was limited by the stock we had. So uh, a basic challenge for us was really to enable continuity of supply to the patient that were uh, supplied by our company Mylan, and that was really a race against time to avoid any market impact. And what was the project output? Indeed, is basically we, we, we had three phases during the project. We had first a feasibility phase that, was, uh, that, that did last two months. So it was really squeezed to the maximum. After that, we, we took about four months during the execution and until submission to the health authorities and after that three months uh, from uh, regulatory approval to a product release. So uh, overall uh, a nine, nine months uh, a transfer, that's why we, we concluded that was uh, quite a fast track uh, in, in the relationship with the challenge that, we, that was ahead. So now I will develop how we came to this fast track. So what are the success factors? How we could come to that performance? So indeed, we, we could split indeed the, the different factors in, in different uh, areas. What is uh, very important indeed, 
previously before the project is the product we transferred was a robust product so some homework had been done by our company before the transfer phase the the, the technical knowledge was present in our team so we, we knew what was critical what was not so critical and and so we could interact efficiently i would say with capsugel and we we had pre-existing commercial contracts with capsugel what are the success factors during the project itself? One, one very important factor is indeed the project organization. And as I, I mentioned earlier, uh, we wanted to delegate to Capsugel the project lead in order to pull the product to their side. So we had to spend some time indeed to define roles and responsibilities within the project so that they are clear at the end. And uh, the, the leading role indeed was, was provided to Capsugel and the facilitation role of Milan and partners was very, very well defined. Also, uh, we, we, we had indeed to take care that the, the, the project lead was highly visible within Capsugel, influential and, and, and highly connected with all the people within Capsugel. Also, uh, in order to enable a fast track, all the teams have been hardly working, so I, I call that time generous. Uh, and uh, responsibilities and, and, and uh, uh, priority were well defined within the, the different companies. And indeed, all, all the project tasks were considered with high, high level of priority. In order also, another success factor that was important for that project that was already mentioned by, by Jane in, in, the, in the previous presentation, is uh, exhaustive uh, uh, use of uh, the quality by design, uh, uh, know-how and procedure developed by Capsugel. So it was very helpful in our project. So we, we spent uh, a significant amount of time by uh, developing and understanding what were the, the critical pro process parameters, how influential they were in the process. And after that, when we, 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 we moved from feasibility to process validation, we were quite uh, knowledgeable on, on how the process could run at the capsule gel side. And also on, on the facilitation, from mainly from the Milan side, we had uh, to implement quick and robust decision-making processes uh, in, in order to facilitate uh, Capsugel work. Of course, uh, in order to enable this, uh, I would say a strong communication interface was developed with weekly conference, and these conferences were 100% were uh, attended, so people attended all the, 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 the conference and we had been able to have open discussion. We, we had many issues, but we could, uh, we could solve them very quickly, and so we could really perceive the trust during, uh, during the interaction. That's a success factor. If the trust is not there and the open discussion do not happen, it's, it's very difficult. Of course, during the project, uh, I would say uh, classical things such as planning uh, uh, of uh, delivering high-quality documentation, uh, 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 and, and also we plan some interaction in, the, in order to develop uh, the, the documentation. We had uh, some manufacturing slots that were facilitated uh, within Capsugel by the project lead. And uh, we, we took the opportunity uh, uh, within Milan to meet uh, the, 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 the regulator in order to anticipate some potential, potential question of a regulator. Also, uh, we, we manage risk uh, quite exhaustively. So uh, we, we have performed uh, a, a risk-based uh, approach and, and also we, we intensively used risk-based decision during the transfer. We, we have been also using or already existing and experienced uh, capsule form apart uh, in order to lower the uncertainty. So this is also linked on a risk base and uh, we have monitored the, the, the risk in, in introducing not too many changes in the CMC documentation. At the end of the, of the project, uh, what I, I, I need to mention is we have done uh, uh, um, a lessons learned session uh, bringing together uh, uh, 
the Capsugel teams, the Milan teams, and uh, the partners. So we, we have been working with another company, and, and we, we, we have been able to consolidate the experience. And, and one uh, thing that indeed we discussed quite extensively, that our project was considered as innovative, because indeed uh, uh, from uh, the QBD approach, I think, developed by Capsugel, and, and having the project le leadership on, on the capsule gel side was considered as being innovative. And of course, we, we have retained all, all the knowledge uh, during the project. So overall, uh, that's, in, in, that's all to, for my message. So Milan capsule gel and Milan partners have been able to efficiently interact to drive a fast track tech transfer for a soft gel capsule to the plural side. And uh, we have been able, doing so, to, to, to supply uh, the product and ensure supply continuity to the French uh, market. As mentioned during the presentation, we have identified, of course, some fast-track drivers, of course, uh, constant focus on results, uh, and a project design, indeed, uh, with a delegation of project management to Capsugel, high uh, communication flows in order to uh, ensure project pace. Of course, we have been able to rely on, on, on the, the knowledge of Capsugel of the quality by design methodology, and we have been able to rely on, on the plural Capsugel strength in project management, in the site procedure on risk management and control, and overall on the technical expertise present on the site. I would be very happy to answer to any question you might have uh, after, after the presentation. Thank you, Mark. Um, uh, for, before we go to the Q&A, we are going to do a poll. The poll question is, would you like Capsigel to follow up with you after the webinar? You'll have about 30 seconds to respond. Okay, now let's move to the Q&A. There is still some time to submit your questions using the Q&A button on the lower left corner of your screen. We have had a lot of great questions today, and we'll get to as many as possible. Here's the first question. What is your experience with developing a liquid-filled hard capsule with a highly potent drug? Okay, I'll, I'll take this question. It's Jane Fraser here. We have a range of high-potency products developed in liquid-filled capsules from early stage development through to full commercial licensed products. This technology we have here offers natural advantages for manufacturing, minimizing airborne contamination through wetting of the API. This reduces containment requirements after dispensing and compounding. The straightforward, more generic process also means that most of the manufacture can be conducted in a standardized manufacturing environment, minimizing any additional cost for specialized containment or a custom-built environment. Liquid filling also has the advantages for low-dose compounds that perfect homogeneity can be achieved through the creation of a solution, reducing many of the mixing and blending issues which could be experienced in a powder-based manufacturing process. Great. Thank you. Our next question, can modified or targeted release be achieved through a liquid-filled hard capsule? I'll also take that question. Um, both of these can be easily achievable and are, again, well suited to the technology. A few approaches are available for modified delivery, depending on the required release profile. This can be based on thermosoftening excipients that are filled as a liquid but hardened to a monolithic core. 
These can be modified with other excipients to create either a retarded erosion system um, or for soluble, for soluble excipients or for a poor controlled diffusion system um, where you have insoluble waxy excipients. So you can, you can tailor um, the excipients um, to, to meet your, your modified release profile. Clinical data has demonstrated uh, modulation of release up to 12 hours for these systems. Targeted release can also be achieved through use of Capsigel's proprietary enteric capsule technology, which provide breakthrough delivery systems for gastric protection. Liquid-filled capsules can also be coated to target more specific release sites, such as the colon, where the liquid can offer advantages of formulation mobility in an environment that can have limited water and this will aid um, in dispersion. Thanks. Our next question. Can you detail a bit more about what should drive the choice between soft and hard capsule? It's an, an excellent uh, question. Uh, so in, uh, I would say from a technical point uh, of view, it's mainly uh, and the fill uh, formula, um, where typically um, a hard capsule has a predefined uh, composition, either gelatin or HPMC, uh, while with the soft shell we can uh, tailor made the shell composition. And we, uh, we include, uh, of course, a plasticizer, but the nature of the plasticizer can be different, can range from glycerol, we can include sorbitol, sorbitan, with the objective typically uh, to uh, to balance uh, any uh, potential migration between uh, fill and shell, also allowing with the plasticizer uh, to avoid a brittleness, which could be an, a challenge when you would bring uh, hydrophilic formulas into a hard gelatin capsule that would have the tendency to uh, take the water out of the hard shell and making the shell somewhat brittle. So that's why the statement hydrophilic formulas typically would move towards soft gel is uh, based on the fact that uh, hydrophilic formulas may take the water out of the hard capsule shell and make it brittle. An option if uh, we don't want to go the soft shell route remains the uh, cellulose capsule, the HPMC, which by nature the water in the HPMC capsule is lower and does not act as a plasticizer as it does for the hard gelatin capsule. I hope this brings uh, some more clarity on the interaction between fill and shell uh, composition. Thank you. The next question, is there any option to formulate a semi-solid formulation as a soft gel? Um, there is certainly. It has been, uh, been done uh, not using uh, a gelatin uh, format. It all depends on the, uh, on the temperature. Uh, there has been uh, a successful attempt to, uh, to use a starch-based uh, soft gel, um, although the, uh, the successes are, are limited. Uh, we see that the majority of the projects uh, worldwide end up uh, in a hard capsule format, either a, a gelatin format or an HPMC, so the most straightforward uh, route would be to go for the hard capsule route if you have a semi-solid formula where we can have filling temperatures up to 60 to 65 degrees Celsius, so which allows quite some flexibility as uh, Jane has uh, shown in her presentation. Thank you. The next question, is it technically feasible for encapsulating live bacterial vaccines for oral, oral delivery? Uh, encapsulation, yes. We at Capsigel have a specific uh, technology uh, for that called uh, Intrinsic, which is a hard capsule format that is uh, intrinsically enteric. So the capsule shell is fully made up of an enteric polymer. And uh, there was, for instance, a poster presentation on this uh, with a company called for the pharma that uh, has been presented at the APS meeting that uh, took place very recently this year, showing that uh, this intrinsic 
a dosage form allows um, encapsulation of um, microbiome material uh, or vaccines for oral delivery. Thank you. To what extent do lip lipidic surfactants in inhibit CYP3A4 activity? We should be a little bit more specific. We are talking here about the CYP3A4 activity in the small intestine, and so not uh, the liver, but uh, within the, uh, um, the small intestine layer. And there, indeed, uh, there is uh, quite some literature. We have, indeed, some, uh, some proof that some lipidic uh, surfactants can, indeed, um, inhibit um, CYP3A4 modulated metabolism in the small intestine, and therefore um, improve bioavailability for what you could call BCS class 4 uh, compounds. Thank you very much. Uh, this will be our final question. We've had a lot of great questions today and couldn't get to them all, but we will be getting back to everyone who submitted personally after the webinar. The final question is, do you have any experience with BA enhancement of BCSIII drugs using this technology? So indeed, the BCS uh, uh, class 3 drugs, um, where indeed uh, we are talking about uh, water-soluble drugs, but typically permeability is a challenge. Um, it's a little bit more uh, depending on what is causing the permeability challenge. But certainly, if it's uh, related to a PGP efflux, uh, lipid-based formulations uh, could be a way forward. It is, however, a little bit more difficult uh, to, uh, to predict from standard um, in vitro experiments on how this will uh, reflect uh, in vivo or in a clinical setting. Thank you all. Thank you for attending this fierce live webinar and submitting so many great questions. I'd like to thank our speakers for participating and Capsigel for presenting today's webinar. This webinar has been recorded. You'll be able to access the recording within 24 hours using the same page used to register for the event. Thank you again for joining and we look forward to seeing you at future events.